What role do you think the Second World War and the Holocaust have played in the development of race science and the way in which we perceive race today or in general how we talk about race? Um, well, I think it was crucial really because if Oh, it's difficult because I don't want to kind of go through alternative versions of history and guess <laughs> what might have happened. I don't know what would have happened. But we do know is before the Second World War, race, science and eugenics were very mainstream and popular in this country, in the US, in many places around the world. And uh, policies were already starting to be introduced in certain countries, eugenic policies. What um, the Nazis did in Germany was really take eugenics to its ultimate step and say how do we eradicate an entire race of people how do we commit genocide um, in order to improve the so-called health of the population that's why it was named racial hygiene mm -hmm. which is really you know the idea of eugenics is kind of wrapped up in this idea of the health of the population and um, the brutality and horror of that is what finally allowed the world to see the moral vacuum that existed within race science and eugenics and also within time to see the scientific vacuum there that actually this is not how genetics works this is not how difference plays out and you cannot breed a master race of people <laughs> it's just not possible to do that um, so you know in that sense what happened during the Second World War was a huge turning point for the way we thought about race. The fact that now we think of racism as a bad thing, that now um, scientific racism is completely unacceptable, is because of that. Because there was a time in history where it wasn't, where it was completely acceptable. The fact that now we think of eugenics as a horrific thing is only because of that. Because before that, it really wasn't. So. That moment, I think, in history, in lots of different ways, not just from this biological perspective, but also for in kind of universalizing humanity. I mean, look at all the, um, look at the UN that emerged out of the Second World War, or the EU, yeah. and the end of colonialism, all these kind of in pan international institutions, these efforts to unite people, to, to have peace finally. Um, around the world. All these efforts were a product of the horror of everything that happened then. And certainly within the sciences, science turned its back on these kind of pseudoscientific uh, theories finally and started to move forward and um, became better. Um, the thing is, as I argue in Superior, we don't ever completely leave the past behind. Mm -hmm. And also we have remarkably short memories. So t enough time has passed, I think, that people have forgotten the reasons why race science was rejected. And also they haven't recognized the ways in which some old ideas were retained in new ways mm -hmm. within science. And that I think on the part of all of us, including well-intentioned scientists, is something that we need to think more carefully about if we're going to move forward. Genocides um, of Holocaust proportion have happened before mm. many times. Yeah. But, um, and I agree with you, the Second World War and the Holocaust that happened in Europe were kind of a turning point in general. Mm. Do you think the fact that the Holocaust in Europe happened in Europe, in front of our eyes, contributed mm. to the impact it has had and the lasting impact it has had on us. Because it has happened before, but yes. nobody even seems to care, or yeah. not many people seem to care or even know. Yeah, and it's happened afterwards, actually. You know, we've had further right. genocide since then. Um, so people don't forget. And like I said before, the ideas and the ideologies remain with us. Um, I don't know what for what reason um, certain events have so much more of an impact than others. Perhaps it's just the scale of those events or the way in which they're carried out. And the Holocaust was particularly brutal and particularly um, enormous, you know, and 
perhaps that it that is it I don't know perhaps because sitting here in Britain that is something proximate to us and not so proximate in other places but you're right these ideologies have always existed and they still exist and this notion that people can be divided and subdivided and that certain groups are better or worse than others superior and inferior that mm -hmm. has existed for a really long time and it still lives with us now and modern day racism is a product of the fact that deep down so many people still believe that some groups are, are superior to others. Mm. At the beginning of Superior you talk about um, some of the experience you've had, the mm. racism that you have experienced. Um, what would you say or what do you think about people who's, who talk about reverse racism? <laughs> and is that even a thing or should it even be a thing? in your eyes, reverse racism? Well, it's possible to feel hatred towards people of another group, and it's always possible to do that. Um, and essentializing a group and, and biologizing them and then creating a target out of them is something that we're all capable of doing. Um, but I think there's an element of racism that involves power, and you hear this in some critical um, some critical race theorists frame it this way that those with power who discriminate against those with less power they do far more damage obviously because they have agency and influence over those people's lives if you don't have agency and influence over someone's life then there's a limit to how much damage you can do to them so i do think power matters in this respect but we all need to be mindful of treating groups as these essential units and then hating them. We, ha we need to be able to move beyond that. But um, it's very difficult to do. And it's very difficult to do while the powerful discriminate against the weak. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the weak feel that they have no other recourse than to hate the powerful. Do you think we need to make a difference between racism and prejudice? I think people already do, yeah. yeah. I think we see that there are different forms of racism, there are different forms of prejudice. You only need to travel throughout the world to see that there are different forms of mm -hmm. prejudice. I mean, one of the chapters in Superior, I look at the caste system in India. And this um, caste is, you know, is not the same as race, but in some ways it overlaps with race or with class. You know, it has elements of both systems, racism and classism. And... Um, But it does essentially the same thing. It groups people together, it treats them as essentially different, and it creates a hierarchy amongst those groups. Um, so we have to recognize prejudice wherever we see it, whatever form it takes. And racism is one form of prejudice. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lots to think about. So um, now you have given us Inferior. Yeah. You have now given us also Superior. Yeah. Both books, I personally love them. Thank you. Um, so what's next? Can we expect anything else very soon or in the far future? You know, I um, Inferior and Superior, I wrote back to back. And right. I started Inferior when my son was two. Um, mm -hmm. I am utterly spent. I spent <laughs> I really exhausted myself writing these two books and also talking about them. I've been going out, you know, all over the world and talking about them in universities. And um, I was my I had every intention this summer of starting another book. Wow. But I have put that on hold temporarily because um, I've just started this new initiative. Um, which I feel I have to, I don't really have, I feel like I have no choice anymore. So I've brought together a panel of experts as scientists, leading scientists, um, social scientists, policy makers, counter extremism experts and tech experts. Um, this group of people to try and tackle the problem of scientific disinformation online and pseudoscience within academia. It's reaching levels at which we can't ignore it any longer. It's having real world consequences. And um, there are a lot of people out there who desperately want to do something about it, especially in academia, because we're feeling helpless right now. What's happening online, we have no control over. Mm -hmm. Lots of governments are pumping money into fighting disinformation. Um, lots of news agencies 
are pumping money into it. But I think we have to recognize that scientific dimension. It is what is propelling the anti-vax movement, climate change denial, also pseudoscientific sexism and racism, uh, uh, motivated for political reasons. Mm -hmm. And um, I really want to do something, come up with some kind of policy responses to tackle this. And I'm hoping this group that we might be able to achieve something. So for the foreseeable future, I'm just going to dedicate myself to doing that. I'm still doing my journalism, my writing, my broadcasting, but um, I just feel that if I don't do this, then then what's the point? You know, we have to do something. We feel, so many of us feel so helpless at the moment that there are things happening in the world that we have no power over. Um, there are terrible things happening and we have to do something and I feel that this is one way I can do something. Why can people um, catch up with you and keep yeah. up with what you're doing if uh, they're interested, you know, especially in this project, which mm. I think sounds really, really fascinating. So I'll be keeping an eye out. <laughs> so well, where can they find you? I've kept it um, quite small for now. I did put out a call on Twitter. I had hundreds and hundreds of responses, which is wonderful. So I'm trying to, at the moment, create uh, project groups for people to be able to do different things within whatever discipline they're in. Um, but it's a slow process, so just just wait and see. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to do my best and come up with things. And I've got such a great team of people. I mean, absolutely the best people I can imagine. So that's great. If we can't do something, then <laughs> so on Twitter, fair. what's your handle? It's Angela D Saini. And where else on social media are you? I'm also on Instagram under the same handle. Great. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank I you. appreciate it.